Okay, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being uh, with us today for the new event of the after the break for the um, ISO Cosmic Duologue back to the Hepatia Colloquium. Um, let me thank immediately our the chairs of the event of today, which are who are um, Tommaso and uh, Aisha. They are gonna they are a fellow and students of our of ISO, and they are gonna. Um, sharing the two sessions. So we are very, very, very happy for this. And actually, I would like to take the chance to, to, to thank our fellows, the students of Viso, because they are volunteering and, and they are sharing the session very nicely. And they are making the, the whole event very enjoyable and very professional also. So thank you very much for doing this. Um, so very, very quickly, just to give uh, uh, a, very, a very short um, Few information about the technicalities. So, as as always, you can uh, people on YouTube they can make the question after the slot of the, the talk uh, using the chat online. While the speaker, the, the people attending the event on the Zoom, um, they can make the question using the chat uh, on Zoom, and then basically the chair will give the word, and so you can uh, go on with the, and make your question. Um, Say, having said that, so there is also for if you are following the, the event on YouTube and you don't feel comfortable or you don't like to make your, to put your question on YouTube, you can also use our form online form on the Ipatia pages. You you go there. There is a form on the right hand side called question. You go there. You can write your question and send it, and this is going to be received by email immediately. And so I can we can see it and then we can pass it to the chair. Also. Just a, if some, a technical point, please be consider that there is always a 20 second, 30 second delay between the time that the event is happening live and the stream on YouTube. So it might happen that you make your question, but the, the, the event already passed. So be patient. Uh, anyhow, anyhow um, the questions is very important that the people make the question and they put them on the YouTube channel because they will stay there in the in the speaker. If there is no time during the event to make to answer to the question, the speaker can can still see them, and they can answer directly on YouTube or later by email. Uh, let me remind you that in fact the um, there is if you go to our pages to the program page of the of the Ipatia event. You can click on the there is a there is a list of the speakers with the title and they can click on the title. You can download the PDF with the the curriculum vitae and of the speakers. So you can then, if interested, you can also contact them uh, and make questions to them and get in touch. Uh, also, of course, the, all the videos are online. So please go to the Ipatia uh, YouTube channel and then there is a there are all the videos also of the past events. So you can watch them and contact all the speakers our speakers please remember that the speaker was selected after a very very competitive uh, selection process so congratulations to the ones who are making the talks and also congratulations to everyone who applied don't next year will be also another chance to go for a talk with that i talk i spoke already too much so i give the word now to tomaso and thank you very much and have fun Thank you, Giacomo. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Hipatia Colloquium of this week. So it's a great honor for me to chair this session. My name is Tommaso Marchetti. I'm an ISO fellow uh, at Garking. So it's a great honor to co-chair together with Aish this session of the Hipatia Colloquium. So we have two speakers for uh, today. Uh, the first speaker is Ilva Gottberg. So Ilva got her PhD at the University of Amsterdam in 2019. And then she moved to the USA, to California, Pasadena, for an Alvin Nashman postdoctoral fellowship at the Carnegie Observatories. And uh, since last year, uh, she is now a Hubble uh, fellow at the Carnegie Observatories in Pasadena. And uh, Ilva works on binary stellar evolution and the effect of, this, uh, of the binaries on the surrounding environments. And she's interested in binaries at both low and high redshifts. And today she will talk about stars stripped in binaries from cosmic reionization to gravitational waves. So Ilva, the stage is yours. You can start sharing your screen. Thank you, Tomaso. Let's see. Uh, okay. 
Okay. Um, thank you very much. And I would also like to thank all of the organizers for giving me this opportunity. I've been really looking forward to give this uh, presentation. Um, so yeah, I work with binaries and today I will talk about uh, star stripping binaries and how they can relate to the early universe through their ionizing radiation and also how they can be gravitational wave sources um, at this moment. So what's so exciting about binaries really and interacting binaries? Well, for example, they can create X-ray binaries and cause accretion onto compact objects. They provide ionizing emission more than what uh, regular single stars do. Uh, they, they create supernovae, both those weird supernovae without hydrogen, but also a large chunk of on the regular supernovae come from interacting binaries. Um, and they all the gravitational waves we've seen so far come from binaries. Uh, and you can also use interacting binaries as probe for other kinds of physics. So today I will focus on two of these, starting with the ionizing emission and then going to gravitational waves. But let's uh, begin with a little background. So how common are binaries actually? This pie chart is uh, from a, a study of O-type stars in, in the galaxy. And what Sun and collaborators found was that 70% of all massive stars follow uh, the binary evolution uh, channel instead of single stellar evolution. The one that, uh, that we think in, uh, that, that in uh, stellar evolution class we're taught that stars follow. So in fact, binary evolution is more common for massive stars than what single stellar evolution is. So what does it mean? Uh, this is split into three main pie charts, the binary evolution. Uh, you can lose the entire hydrogen rich envelope. You can cause a lot of accretion onto an object or even merger. So this is really kind of drastic events. It can give rise to a large variety of different processes and different types of stars. So I will not go into details on all of these. Um, and I will focus on the envelope stripping part here, the third of, of these objects. So just so that we are all on the same page, we will uh, look at a little uh, movie showing you how how a star can be stripped off its envelope. Okay, so what's just happened here? We had the most massive star in the system that was trying to swell up to become a red supergiant. But its outer layers started to feel a stronger gravitational pull to its companion than to itself at some point. What then happens is that the envelope flows to the companion as the star tries and tries and tries to swell up. Eventually what is left is just that hot and compact helium core that is completely uh, exposed to the surroundings. So let's look at this in a more serious way. Here we have a little chart of uh, how this star was created, main sequence stars, mass transfer or Rushlop overflow, and the result is this stripped star. If we look at um, a typical Hertzsprung-Russell diagram here that can show stellar evolution tracks, here is temperature of the surface of the star in the reverse direction versus luminosity. In gray, you can see the uh, evolutionary track of a 12 solar mass single star that evolves towards cooler temperatures. Uh, instead, in color, you can see the evolution of a star that loses its envelope over here, and the track changes direction, going uh, in the opposite way. Eventually, these stars explode in different types of supernovae. The single star as a type 2 supernova, while the stripped star explodes as a um, hydrogen-free type 1b supernova in this particular model. Most of the time, the stripped star spends over here. And we can look at the, the background shading of this figure, uh, which shows the fraction of the emitted flux of the star that is ionizing. And you can see that once the star is stripped, it becomes a much better source of ionizing radiation. So this is something we're going to look into a little bit later as well. Um, so I was curious about this and try to understand how much ionizing radiation do they actually uh, emit? So with uh, a stellar evolution uh, model like this, what you can provide uh, is 
a simply a Planck curve. So here we have wavelength with flux of the star, and it's not very informative, right? How, how does it actually look like? So what I did, I used the surface properties of that stellar evolution model, the structure model, as input in a radiative transfer code called CMFJ to model the spectrum and the spectral energy distribution of the star. It looks like this. So here we can start now to see some detail. First, we can count how many photons are ionizing. In this case, it was 83%. There is some large uh, difference here compared to the, um, to the Planck curve, but that's just in this weak helium-2 ionizing regime. You can also see a lot of detail here with the spectral features, which is also really interesting. So uh, this, four solar mass trip star that came from that 12 solar mass progenitor is a really hot object. It, it, it has in fact 80,000 Kelvin and it's also really small, uh, about 0.7 solar radii. So if we summarize, I, I made a model for a range of mass of these. The strip stars are in, in general really hot between 30 and 100,000 Kelvin and very small, typically less than the solar radius. They can span a range of luminosities uh, depending on their mass, so between maybe 10 and a million solar luminosities. And because they are the exposed cores of their progenitors, they are helium rich and hydrogen poor. So let's start to look at the fact that they are hot and that they emit a lot of ionizing radiation. We just looked at uh, the evolution of um, a stripped star and uh, how, how they may look like and so, but now let's put it into context of a full stellar population and maybe also uh, investigate a little bit how they can affect uh, during even larger scale during cosmic ionization. So this is work that comes from uh, last year and the year before uh, and it starts with this diagram showing you the uh, emission rate of hydrogen ionizing photons on the y-axis uh, for uh, um, a coeval stellar population of a million solar masses, a starburst, as function of time after that starburst. So in green, you can see the emission rate of ionizing photons from single stars or in non-interacting binaries as function of time. And because most of those ionizing photons come from the most massive stars in the system, which, which die first, uh, after just a few million years, this rate drops really quickly. You can see this is log scale, so it goes really, really fast. However, after a few, uh, maybe 10 million years or so, the stripped stars can be formed, and then they really boost the ionizing emission. At 10 million years, maybe by a factor of 10, but at 100 million years, when they still go strong, they can provide orders of magnitude more ionizing emission than uh, what the single stars would have done. So how does the spectrum of such a population look like? Let's have a look at 20 million years after the starburst. Here you can see again a spectral energy distribution. In green is the contribution from the single stars and the non-interacting binaries. And in blue is the contribution from the stripped stars. So you can see that the stripped stars significantly boost the ionizing emission, but also provide much harder ionizing emission than what is predicted in the green curve. So uh, uh, now if the stripped stars contribute so much with uh, ionizing emission, why is it that we have not uh, seen this uh, important population? If we look at now at this wavelength range, so over here we have the optical, uh, which is ac accessible from the ground. And here is the ultraviolet, which we can observe uh, through space. Um, you can see that in that part of the wavelength range, the strip stars contribute less than a percent of the emitted flux. Also, there is no significant uh, stellar lines that can pierce through that as a bright uh, radiation from the other stars. So in these wavelength ranges, th they are not directly observable. In the ionizing regime, they really dominate, but the ionizing radiation can easily get absorbed by uh, neutral hydrogen in the Milky Way surrounding the Earth or so. So, so it's hard to, to detect in this regime. It's not uh, directly observable. But uh, I think that we can come up with ways to anyway see this ionizing radiation just in an indirect way. 
So let's start with uh, looking at the stellar population in a cartoon way. Here, if we look at just the stellar light, um, we will not be able to see the stripped stars, but the stellar population typically has a, a bit of, of clouds surrounding it, some nebula, right? So if the, this really hard ionizing radiation shines on that nebula, it can ionize the, the elements in the nebula and cause them to shine. And then from that specific signature that they, these elements shine with, you uh, may be able to detect the presence of this hard ionizing source. So let's look a little closer at that. Here is again a spectrum. I have now flipped it to show photon energy on the x-axis and the normalized flux on the y-axis. Here normalized at the ionization limit of hydrogen, so at 13.6 electron volts. And in gray, you can see the uh, flux from a stellar, a young stellar populations with only single stars. As you can see, this is a soft spectra. If you include the stripped stars, the picture completely changes and you have a much harder uh, spectrum. So where, how does this relate to the, uh, the limits of different uh, ionization edges? If we can start with looking at helium, for example, helium tends to shine uh, in, in recombination lines. So, for example, fully ionized helium to uh, ionized helium uh, provides uh, some interesting recombination lines. And therefore, this flux is really interesting for understanding recombination lines uh, in surrounding nebula. Now, this is not so much, but uh, it could be in some cases that it could be a little bit more. Let's look at oxygen. Oxygen uh, ionization uh, is also really different in the rela relation here of the fraction of the flux that these two populations would have. Uh, for example, the stripped stars could contribute more to oxygen three. So that's a collisionally excited line, and then you would then uh, see oxygen three line by this population, uh, this flux here. Carbon, I think, is really interesting because uh, you can see that there is some carbon. Uh, three to carbon four ionizing flux here, uh, which uh, actually uh, has started to be observed in uh, some populations. So this is uh, this work by Berg and collaborators in 2019, where they saw nebular carbon four lines uh, in a, in a nearby starburst. So I think this is uh, interesting avenues to investigate the stellar population uh, in a different. Uh, uh, in different galaxies. So how much ionizing emission do the stripped stars really uh, emit? If we would just sum up this diagram up here uh, in, and um, count how what fraction do the stripped stars contribute, it's just about 5% or so compared to the massive stars. However, the massive stars tend to be uh, blocked by the surrounding nebula because they uh, emit their ionizing photons so early. So there is still a lot of ionizing nebula around, or uh, around uh, blocking nebula around that ionizing radiation. Uh, while strip stars, they can emit their photons much later when that nebula has already been dispersed. So if you account for that in some simple way, the contribution from strip stars may have been uh, about tens of percent or so, for the photons that actually reach the intergalactic medium. And if we look at this in terms of the cosmic reionization, here is the that uh, emission rate of ionizing photons reaching the cosmic the intergalactic medium as function of redshift. And you can see that the strict star's contribution become much uh, more and more important as the redshift decreases and cosmic reionization is thought to occur somewhere here. So at that time, they, they would have uh, contributed significantly. In this model, if you convolve it with the uh, uh, cosmic star formation rate, and uh, then it is convolved with the uh, cosmic star formation rate, and then balance it with the uh, uh, expected if amount of neutral hydrogen in the intergalactic medium, you can estimate when cosmic reionization should occur. So here on the y-axis, I show the fraction of the hydrogen in the intergalactic medium that is ionized as a function of redshift. And uh, reionization is complete when it reaches one. When you only account for single stars, uh, it, it occurs later compared to when you include the stripped stars. So stripped stars, 
caused cosmic reionization to occur maybe 100 million years early or so. It may sound short, but given the age of the universe at this time, it really matters. And it shifts uh, in this model, very simple model, the uh, redshift of reionization from 6 to 6.5. So that can be actually quite interesting. So if we look here at some ob obser observational uh, constraints, so this is now neutral fraction, so you will have to flip it in your mind. I'm sorry about that. Uh, the, the between 6 and 6.5 really matters and it's a large uncertainty and, and uh, yeah, so, uh, so that would be really interesting. Now let's move from the fact that the strips are uh, stars are hot to that they are small and talk about how the strip stars can be sources of uh, uh, gravitational waves. This is an artist impression of a helium star or a strip star. Uh, orbiting a compact object, I think in this case, a neutron star or black hole. And you can see that it transfers material, which only happens if the binary is very, very, very tight because the strip star is so small, right? So because it is very tight, it's actually possible that these objects emit gravitational waves. So let's go through a little bit how you can create gravitational waves from such objects. Let's start with two star, uh, main sequence stars in the binary. The most massive one loses its envelope, becomes a strip star. The strip star evolves into a compact object. And if that binary remains bound, mass ratio can be really large, which causes a common envelope to be developed in the later stage when the secondary actually interacts. If the system survives that, you are uh, left with a tight or big binary of a strip star with a compact object. This may or may not in, uh, enter interaction again. And the strip star eventually uh, evolves into a compact object. And if that system survives uh, it, it, and is tight enough, it, mi it might uh, lead to a merger uh, of two compact objects. This thing that we are so used to seeing now. Uh, eventually. So let's look a little bit at what's the gravitational wave frequency to expect for these uh, different systems. Gravitational wave frequency is actually quite easy to estimate. It's just two over the orbital period. So down here, the period is of order seconds, uh, which means that the gravitational wave frequency should be less than kilohertz, so exactly in the range of LIGO and Virgo. So that's um, a designed to be able to see these objects. However, up here, the orbital period is more like hours, uh, which corresponds to a little bit less than millihertz uh, seconds, uh, millihertz frequencies. That's actually in the regime of this proposed space mission LISA, which you can see an artist impression of here. And it's supposed to be able to see um, a source gravitational wave sources in the sub millihertz uh, in the millihertz regime. So because these stars still are actually undergoing nuclear fusion, they are a little bit rare as gravitational wave sources. Most gravitational wave thought sources are thought to be uh, remnants or so, but these are actually still, so to say, alive. So I got curious about them and I uh, made a very simple population model for how many of these trip stars uh, orbiting tight uh, compact objects there, there should be in the galaxy and whether we would be able to see them with Lisa. Uh, I will not go into detail how, how I made the model, but I will show you what the results are. So here is uh, the gravitational wave frequency on the x-axis. And this is the gravitational wave strength, so to say, on the y-axis. And I have here shown the sensitivity of LISA, where the detectable region is in white and the, what is not detectable is in gray. The population that I created is a Monte Carlo uh, code, so it, it shows up in different objects. Here you can see in blue, strip stars orbiting white dwarfs, and in dark blue, strip stars orbiting uh, neutron stars. In this particular simulation, there is about five sources that uh, are expected to be detectable, but this can vary from zero to 100 or so, uh, depending on the assumptions that you make for this population. For example, this is very much limited by the minimum radius of the star, and also the assumption for the orbital period extent, as you can see in dashed lines here. Um, 
and uh, these are uncertain uh, astrophys astrophysical properties and therefore observing this population could help understanding better uh, a, how, for example, post-common envelope uh, systems look like. In comparison to the common double white dwarfs that are um, a part of the main uh, LISA mission, uh, the strip stars have a shorter um, or smaller frequencies, and um, sometimes also a little bit louder, a little bit stronger gravitational waves uh, because they are more massive. Okay, and that's what we can constrain here. So just to sum up, um, I, what I want you to remember from my presentation is that strip stars can provide ionizing radiation at late times in a stellar population. It's also much harder than or what uh, the regular single stars produce. And also that a uh, strip stars when orbiting a compact object uh, can radiate gravitational waves. And this may be detectable with LISA and we can use it to better understand stellar astrophysics. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk, Ilva. That was really, really nice. So, uh, questions now. So I saw that there's one question on YouTube, which was asked before. The question is, how can you distinguish between strip stars and post-RGB or post-AGB stars? Oh, that's a very nice question. So, um, Post AGB stars are, um, um, I would, I would maybe call them pre-white dwarfs, right? So this would be objects that still have, uh, or that, that are about to become white dwarfs. They tend to uh, be a little faint there if you compare it to the more massive strip stars. So like a four solar mass strip star is much brighter than a post AGB star or so. But it may be confusing uh, for the lower mass regime. And um, I, uh, I agree that that's something that is not trivial. However, their surface gravities should be different. And uh, that's something that I think that you would be able to see in the spectrum if you would be able to have a spectrum. The ionizing contribution from the post-AGB stars uh, comes much later than the one from strip stars, and it's also much fainter. So this is work from Nell Beiler, for example, in 2019, where you can see that. Uh, I hope that that could help a little bit with the answer. Thank you. So then there is a question here from Ilsan Yun. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Silva for the very nice presentation. Uh, my question is a bit naive, but I'm wondering, can you comment how much the evolution of the stripped stars depends on the model? So it could impact your ionizing emission as a function of your know, time. Yes, of course. Um, let's go back to the evolutionary model. This matters, it's not at all naive. Uh, for uh, solar metallicity, the effect is smaller because it's what you can do, for example, you can strip the envelope earlier or later. And if you do it late, um, a, and, and that, what the difference is, is the size of the rush lobe, right? So with the larger rush lobe, when you detach, there may be more uh, material inside of that rush lobe that contracts with the strip star, leaving a larger uh, layer on top of the strip star. At solar metallicity, the opacity is so high that the, the, the density is really low in the rush lobe when you contract. But at lower metallicity, this may be different. For example, in the SMC, we expect that there should be a significant difference depending on, for example, what is the period when you strip off the envelope or so. What also matters is the wind mass loss rate that you assume for this uh, strip star. Um, and it's it's not well known at all what is the wind mass loss rest rate for strip stars. So um, we think it's relatively low, but uh, there, the observational evidence there are seem to suggest that it's more um, high. Um, so we still, I would say we need to uh, observe more of these stars and make constraints uh, for the wind mass loss rate to better understand that. That affects, for example, the supernova later on and whether the system interacts or not with the progenitor like, these kind of things. So it's actually really interesting, yeah. So 
So then there is another question from Dietrich. Yeah, very uh, enjoyable talk. Thank you very much. Um, people have stacked the spectral energy distributions of high mm -hmm. redshift star forming galaxies, star burst galaxies. Mm -hmm. And uh, can one see in the stacked SED uh, some trace of the additional ionizing flux uh, that you're predicting from your models? Um, so that's an, a really interesting question. I wouldn't dare to claim that uh, this specific feature comes from the strip star yet, but there are some interesting implications. Now, very recent stack spectra from a higher redshift or so that show, for example, helium two lines, or even in some cases, some car highly ionized carbon lines that um, are indications of, of too hard ionizing uh, spectrum compared to what the spectral synthesis models uh, predict. So for example, that galaxy I showed, so this, this is just one galaxy, but that galaxy I showed from uh, Daniel Berg, uh, where was it here? This galaxy has too hard and too much ionizing radiation compared to uh, what the spectral models predict. So the, the, for example, this carbon line you can never reproduce and uh, the helium too as well. So it is really quite interesting. And I think we still have some work to do with um, understanding the spectra of uh, stellar populations. Thank you. Then we have a question on the YouTube chat. So Anna Scorza says, hello Ilva, great talk. Is there any system where you can for sure say that there is a strip star? Ah, very nice. Thanks, Anna. Uh, yes, I think, yes, there is. Uh, the, there is a, a system called HD45166, which for sure contains a four solar mass strip star and a 4.8 solar mass B, compa B type companion, if I remember correctly. So in a very tight orbit, so 1.5 day orbit is maybe the result of a common envelope evolution. And this particular object shows a high wind mass loss rate, um, which, which is very puzzling, also slow wind, not what we expect. Uh, but in ongoing studies that I'm doing with uh, my collaborator Maria Drought in the Magellanic Cloud, we are looking for strip stars and uh, we have found some nice candidates that uh, I hope will be published this spring. So uh, hopefully then you can see um, some other confirmed objects. So that will be fun. So if there are no further questions, that's Thank Ilva again for the was really, really beautiful talk. Very clear. Thank you very much. And uh, so, yeah, I'll give the word now to Aish so we can, uh, she can introduce the second speaker of today. Thank you, Tommaso. Also, thanks, Ilva, for the very nice talk. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. I'm Ashwara Girder, a second year PhD student at ESO. Um, and I would move on to the next speaker. It's a, very, it's a pleasure to co-chair with Tommaso. So let's invite our next speaker. Uh, we have today Matthew Renzo, and um, he did his PhD from the University of Amsterdam, uh, finished it in uh, 2019, and is now a postgrad fellow at the Flatteron Research Institute. So um, welcome, Matthew, and I give you the stage uh, to talk about clues from gravitational waves on pulsational pair instability. Just a reminder, please feel free to ask your questions through Zoom, through YouTube, or through the form. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me move you here. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for giving me the chance of talking about big stars that explode, which is what I work on. And today I want to in particular talk about pulsational pair instability supernovae, which is a particular kind of explosion that we think happens in the at the end of the life of the most massive stars. And in particular, I would like to talk about what can we learn about this process from the black hole masses that LIGO and Virgo have already been detected. And so these, uh, let me start from the black hole masses that we knew before the gravitational wave detections. So probably many of you uh, have seen this visualization before, 
these are uh, compact object masses, so neutron stars in yellow and black holes in purple. Uh, the value is on the y-axis, while the x-axis doesn't mean anything, it's just spread around the points. And these are all the masses that we knew of before gravitational waves that come from uh, looking at the orbit of X-ray binary system. So these compact objects have a star and they're accreting mass from their companion star. Now, since 2015, this landscape has changed dramatically. In particular, these are the uh, gravitational wave detection as of LIGO 03A. And we've seen a, a few binary neutron star mergers, but really the biggest difference is in the black hole masses. You can see all these blue dots are two black holes that merge with each other and form a third black hole. And as you can see, all the blue dots are on the higher end of these purple dots, which is expected given what uh, part of the universe uh, or uh, what fraction of the universe LIGO is observing. And now that we start having so many data, we can start trying to search for structure in this black hole uh, mass function. And one way to do this is to look at the merger rates uh, of gravitational wave events. So this is what you see here on the y-axis. And it's shown here as a function of the biggest black hole among the two that are merging. And uh, exactly five years ago, we had absolutely no information on the y-axis. And we only knew maybe this first quadrant of the x-axis. But now today, we have a merger rate as a function of mass that extends all the way to five times higher masses. And we're starting to see structure appear in this uh, merger rate as a function of black hole mass. And in this talk, I will first try to talk about the stars that might make this feature appear. So the progenitors of black holes below 45 to 50 solar masses. And then in the second part of the talk, I will address this tail of black holes that extend at very high masses, and hopefully it will become clear why these are a puzzle for stellar astrophysics. And I will try to highlight some um, areas where we need to do a bit more careful investigation uh, to try to explain how we form these black holes. So let me start with the first part and discuss the life and especially the death of the progenitors of black holes below 50 solar masses. And the, these progenitors will encounter the pair instability. And this is something that happens deep in the core of an evolved massive star after core carbon burning. And since all of the dynamics is driven by the core uh, for computational reason, we can get rid of the hydrogen envelope. This simplifies the problem greatly, but there are also physical reasons to do this. In particular, here I'm, I'm thinking about gravitational wave progenitors. And if you think that uh, the black hole that we detected through gravitational waves evolved already as a star with a binary companion, which uh, we know is fairly common, then there are many ways in which the progenitor star might, has, might have lost its hydrogen envelope. In particular, these, uh, as I'll show you in a second, are huge stars that can lose the envelope through winds. And as Ilva has just described, if you put stars in a binary, it's rather common for them to lose their hydrogen envelope. And that's particularly true for any kind of isolated binary evolution scenario that leads to the formation of a gravitational wave progenitor. So we're gonna simulate naked helium cores. And these are uh, encountering this pair instability only if they're massive enough where massive enough means that they have to be above 30 solar masses at the very end of their evolution. So when they're about to collapse and form a black hole. And this guarantees that these stars are radiation pressure dominated, which means what holds them up against gravity is the photon pressure. And if these conditions are met, you will encounter this pair instability that can cause sometimes a full supernova explosion, and uh, these are probably the best understood uh, supernovae from massive stars. You can see that these are not new ideas. Uh, they were uh, developed already at the end of the 60s, 
but there's been really a huge explosion in the modeling of these uh, uh, stars because of the gravitational waves. And so these very big radiation pressure dominated cores, as they evolve before they run out of nuclear fuel, they encounter disease instability. And this is due to the production of an electron positron pair from two photons. This reaction removes some photons and so it softens the equation of state because the photons were the thing holding up the star. And this can cause a runaway collapse of the star because you remove the photons, the star has less pressure support, so it collapses a little bit. This increases the temperature, it increases the rate of pair production and speeds up this collapse. But as star collapse and contract, their temperature go up. And since this is happening while we still have nuclear fuel, typically oxygen, this collapse can cause a thermonuclear explosion, although we're looking at a very massive star. And this thermonuclear explosion can have three different outcomes. The first one that was studied already in the 60s is when this thermonuclear explosion here frees more energy than the entire binding energy of the star. Therefore, all of the gas flies away and we have what is called a pair instability supernova. The nomenclature can be a little bit confusing, but a pair instability supernova leaves no black hole remnant. Everything flies away. If you lower the mass of your star a tiny bit, then this explosion is less powerful and it will only trigger a shock wave that can eject some of the outer layers. If you had a hydrogen envelope, the hydrogen envelope is likely to go away the first time this happens. And then this, what, what's left of the star will relax again, cool down and maybe hit the instability again, loop through this circle a few times until the consumption of fuel the loss of mass and the loss of entropy each time it relaxes and emits tons of neutrinos will stabilize the core. And once the core is stabilized, it finishes burning if there is anything left to burn and then forms a black hole, maybe with, maybe without a, super, a normal core collapse supernova explosion. The third possible outcome is for stars that are instead even more massive than pair instability progenitors. And in this case, the process starts exactly the same, but at this step, a second instability kicks in that cancels out the pair production. And the second instability is the photo disintegration of nuclei. In particular here, this burning happens at such low density that every new nucleus that you form through fusion can immediately be photo disintegrated. And so all the energy is being used to put together nuclei and break them apart. None of this energy goes into kinetic energy of the gas. And in the end, you form a black hole again. And so this should start telling you why there should be some black holes that are forbidden by stellar evolution, if this is correct. Because we have black holes at the low mass, mass end, and their mass is determined by the amount of mass loss here. Then we have no black hole for a whole range of pair instability. And then if stars sufficiently massive exist in the universe, we would form black holes again. So there should be a pair instability black hole mass gap. And this is what you're seeing here. So these are the black hole masses as a function of the helium core masses that we initialize our simulation with. So these will decrease first because of the wind mass loss and then because of these pulses. Or you can look at the top axis where you have the carbon oxygen core mass, which is a better metric since it depends much less on the winds. And so you see on the far left, there is a straight line. This is models that are too low mass to pulsate and they form a black hole through a normal core collapse. Then in green, you start, you start seeing the pulsation which remove progressively more and more mass and cause a turnover in this black hole mass uh, function with a maximum mass of about 45 solar masses. Then in yellow, you have this pair instability regime where you don't form any black holes. And for helium cores that are above 200 solar masses at the end of the main sequence, you would get black hole formation again, forming about 130 solar mass black holes. And so the gap should be roughly between 50 and 120 solar masses. 
And sure, this is just one set of specific models, but actually in the literature, especially in recent years, there is kind of a broad agreement on the black hole masses that one should get out. And in particular, we've also studied like, for example, the sensitivity of these to many uh, modeling uncertainties, or as I'm showing you here, is a zoom in on the lower left corner, so the bottom edge. And here, each curve shows the black hole masses for different metallicities. So you can think of it as different host galaxies where these stars, the progenitor stars are evolving. And you can see that changing the metallicity by more than two orders of magnitude, the maximum black hole mass below the gap only varies by about 7%, which is a relatively small amount. And so if we are able to detect this gap and detect this, its lower edge, then it might be possible to standardize the lower edge of the gap so that we can make a standard siren to do cosmology with gravitational waves. And this, of course, requires that uh, weird things that can happen in nature don't pollute the gap too much. And we've checked the robustness of these results also against uh, many other physical ingredients that enter these simulations. And the only ingredient that seemed to have really an important effect is the rate of one specific reaction rate, the C12 alpha gamma oxygen 16. And the good thing, this doesn't uh, damage the prospects for doing cosmology because hopefully the universe picks one rate for its entire evolution but we don't know what this rate is. And depending on the rate that you assume for this reaction, you get a different carbon to oxygen ratio. If you have more carbon, your star can have a bigger carbon shell burning that prevents the core from going unstable. And so if you lower the rate of this reaction, your black hole mass gap will move to higher masses. But if you increase the rate, Basically, once you run out of carbon, this doesn't affect that much the location of the gap anymore. And so again, if we can measure the position of this gap, we might also be able to do nuclear physics using black hole masses measured through gravitational waves, which would be uh, very interesting and complementary to other ways that we have to look at these reaction rates. And so to go back to this picture, this is again, the gravitational wave merger rate as a function of mass. This feature uh, at about 40 star masses is probably the most uncontroversial piece of evidence that all these processes that I just described actually happens in nature because pair instability removes mass from the black holes. And so you get a pile up at slightly lower masses than where the gap should be. And in this plot, uh, I'm showing you only one particular fit to the gravitational wave data, but pretty much all the models that have been explored prefer some feature between 30 and 60 solar masses. For now, it's not very well constrained. However, there is also this whole part of black holes that is sitting firmly inside this predicted black hole mass gap. And these are relatively rare. They constitute about 3% of uh, the black holes that LIGO infers exist in the universe, but it's uh, an open question, how can we form these systems? And as you can probably imagine, these, um, explaining these very big forbidden black holes is a very active topic of research. And there have been many, many ideas that have been proposed and I won't have time to kind of summarize all of them. I will instead focus on one particular scenario that was also considered by, by the LIGO papers, which is this stellar merger scenario. And this is an attempt of bypassing the pair instability black hole mass gap using only stellar physics and relying on a merger to avoid the gap. So this scenario was originally proposed by Spera et al uh, based on n-body simulations uh, where they took two stars that are below the mass for the pair instability regime. And just at the end of the main sequence of the first star, they merge them together. And this creates a star which has the core of the first star, but in the envelope, it has the envelope of star one, 
plus the total mass of the second star. So this makes uh, for these masses round about 100 solar mass stars with a small core of uh, a star that cannot pulsate. It's too small to pulsate. And if this weird star with a small core and a big envelope can hold on to its mass and collapses to a black hole, swallowing its entire envelope, then you can make a black hole in the gap. But you've made only one black hole. So how do you get a gravitational wave source? Well, you put this system in a cluster and you use dynamics to find another black hole and get a gravitational wave merger. Now, this scenario is interesting, but uh, it relies on a few uh, simplifications or things that should be checked a little bit more carefully. For example, the merger process is assumed to be fully conservative. No mass is lost. Uh, it neglects, for example, the impact of angular momentum on the merger product. And maybe crucially, it assumes that the merger doesn't mess with the core of the star. In particular, uh, there is no rejuvenation effect, which is something that we would expect when you increase the mass of a star. And then there is the question of whether these hypothetical merger product with a small core could actually hold on to its mass because we know that 100 solar mass stars tend to be pretty violent and eject erupts uh, constantly. So if you make a weird one, is that getting better or worse? And finally, there is the issue of the fate of the hydrogen envelope when the black holes form. And so here, just to try to highlight the subtle points of, of this scenario, what we did is to make a very simple merger model following the basic assumptions of this scenario. So neglecting rotation and assuming that at the merger, the core of the biggest star that merges is not modified by the merger itself. And so to create this um, merger model, well, we first start by evolving the two stars that we want to merge. I took masses from the typical masses of the scenario and I'm showing you here the mass fraction of helium and hydrogen as a function of mass coordinating the stars. So zero is the center and the end of the, these tracks is the surface. And these are evolved until the star one has a fully helium core. So end of its main sequence. And at this stage, star two is 75% helium in its core. This is because massive stars are close to the Eddington luminosity and they all have very similar lifetimes. And so these are our building blocks from where we have to build our merger. And by hypothesis, we cannot touch this core. The core has to remain the same. So where do we put this helium? We can't put it on top of the core. Uh, so the core of star one, then core of star two, and then the envelopes, because that would make the core get bigger and enter the parent stability regime. So we bracket the possibilities by uh, making two different models. And this is the composition profile for our merger that we start from. The first, the solid lines are obtained by taking star two and completely mixing it in the envelope of star one. So this means that we mix helium from the core of star two into the surface of star one. And this gives the solid lines here and a helium-rich envelope. The second model that brackets the possibilities is let's forget about the evolution of star two and consider it uh, just at its initial composition. And that gives the dashed lines. And these, of course, are very crude models. You see there is a core and an envelope is basically starts as a two-zone model. But uh, with MES, I can now uh, evolve it on, up to the onset of core collapse. And this is showing you the HR diagram, luminosity and effective temperature for these two models. The blue one is the one where we mix the envelope, so it's helium rich and more luminous. And the red one is the one where we neglect the uh, uh, evolution of the secondary. The evolution goes from uh, left to right as in a normal HR diagram. And you can see that these stars spend a lot of time in this gray band. This is the S Dorados instability strip, which we uh, observe stars in those positions to experience outbursts of mass loss. And we have theoretical reasons to expect that if a star is helium rich, it might be more prone to go through these outbursts. 
And then you can see that they evolve beyond this dotted line, which is the Humphrey Davidson limit. And here they reach super Eddington luminosity, which is again an indication of potential outbursts of mass loss. And that's what drives these uh, crazy oscillations in the tracks. And just to hammer down the point that these stars are likely to be unstable, the best models that we have for Eta Carine, a star in our own galaxy that uh, went to giant outbursts losing tens of solar masses in the 1800s, the best models that we have for this is actually a merger between two very massive stars, so kind of similar to what we're seeing here. And unfortunately, we don't have a self-consistent way to put the mass loss in these models, so we cannot fully uh, uh, quantify how much mass is left from the black hole. But let's assume that the mass is kept on. Then the other question is, what is the fate of the envelope when the black hole forms? And when black holes form, they still release a lot of energy. All the binding energy of the core is about 10 to the 53 ergs. And these can be used to power some transients, either shocks that can unbind the envelope, um, or you could have a collapsor scenario where rotation powers disk formation and an explosion, in particular for a merger product, or you could have fallback powered explosions. However, we're uh, taking our merger models. If you look at the HR diagram, they're still fairly blue when they explode. And the majority of these mechanisms uh, basically uh, work not very well for blue supergiants. So the amount of mass loss that we estimate from our mergers at black hole formation is rather small. So I'm going to skip this and jump to the conclusions. And I hope that in this talk, I uh, convinced you that the features that we're seeing appearing in the binary black hole uh, uh, mass spectrum are the most uncontroversial evidence for pulsation of brain stability in nature. And we could use them both for cosmology and nuclear physics. And that this tail of black holes that seems to enter in a forbidden region uh, of black hole mass range really probably requires some dynamics to form. And if you want to use the dynamics with the stars and merge the stellar progenitors rather than black holes, then you do really require that uh, this merger goes uh, is lucky in a few places. And in particular, you require the full envelope fallback. And that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. Uh, it was a very intriguing talk indeed. Uh, I would like to invite questions. Um, so Ilsang, please go ahead. Uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you very much. It's very nice talk and also very educational. I, mean, I, want, I want to ask one question. You mentioned that a several possibility to explain a, the higher mass tails of this you know, the merger rate. But I'm wondering, can we simply, because you mentioned the carbon oxygen ratio, that changes a, the, the two limits in the quite a bit of the range. If you introduce a the varying carbon oxygen ratio, can you explain those, you know, the tails of the merger rate in the high mass end? So it, it, many people have tried precisely this game. Uh, based on our results to explain like the most massive black hole detected so far is like 85 solar masses. So to get it below the gap, you would have to move these carbon uh, alpha rates by 2.5 sigma, lowering it by 2.5 sigma, which is a big amount. And all the um, lab nuclear physics experiments seems to push it up, actually, these rates. And also, if you look at this feature here, of course, if you want to create these black holes, you're also going to move this feature as well. And this feature is maybe on the low side rather than on the high side. So I don't think that is the uh, most promising solution uh, here. It, it, it could be possible, but I think you would also mess the, the location of this feature if you try to explain this. No, I see. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for the question. Are there any other questions for our speaker? Please, please feel free to ask through YouTube or uh, through the chat.
can I ask a question maybe? Yes, please. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was just wondering. Um, the um, many of these stars are formed uh, in uh, star clusters, and they are fairly violently dynamic, dynamically violent. Um, they form this binary so multiple systems, and they interact, and uh, the stars would then merge. And this this might um, mix the components. Um, in, in a way where, which I'm not sure if you would have taken that into account or if it can be taken into account, or have you uh, even possibly thought of that, um, this, this possibility? So, so indeed, well, basically, um, yeah. the stellar merger scenario kind of relies exactly on these dynamics in clusters mm -hmm. to drive uh, the yeah. merger. Unfortunately, modeling mergers is quite hard. And as far as I know, nobody has tried to do an end-to-end -end simulation, including pairing stability or for this mass regime. I think it's actually the critical thing to do is assess in these kind of mergers, whether they're dynamical or driven by binary evolution, what happens to the core of, of the merger product is, is crucial to decide whether it goes pairing stability or not. And I think this is the area where uh, we need most work for this merger scenario. Mm -hmm. So, so are you are you involved with um, people who are doing star cluster dynamics um, by any chance? Uh, not very not directly. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a lot of work on on uh, runaway stars, so I'm, I'm familiar with that literature for, for that yeah. part of mm -hmm. my work, but I'm not directly working on it myself. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any more questions. So I would like to thank uh, Matthew and both our speakers, also Ilva, and I would like to hand over to Giacomo now. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Aish. Thank you for for chairing the session. Also, from my side, just I would like to thank you and, and Tomas, of course, for chairing the sessions and Ilva and um, Mathieu, for the very, very nice talks. And in particular, let me spend the word for Ilva. Thank you, because it's very early in the morning. So she made a, a very, very big effort to be for being with us. Thank you very much, Ilva, <laughs> for doing that. And uh, with this, we can close. And thanks also to our, um, to our attendees. It's very, very uh, appreciated that you, the, that you, attend, you, you attend these talks, because as, let me remind you very quickly, this is really intended to be a platform for our early career scientists to sh to, to 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 show us that what they do, this, the excellent science that they are doing. So this it's very very appreciated that people attend these talks, and so keep on doing this. Thank you very much. And with this, uh, I guess we will see you next week again. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye bye. <laughs>